listening to the Today's Mama podcast with your host, Rachel Hersher. Hello, I'm Rachel Hersher, a mother, an entrepreneur, and a perpetual question asker. This podcast is all about how we care for the things that we care about the most, our families, our dreams, and yes, ourselves too. I'll be interviewing other smart people to find out who they are, how big they dream, and how to raise good humans along the way. Stick around, and of course, subscribe and tell your friends. Okay, so we are so excited to be taping our very first podcast with Angela Santamero. We lucked out. She is the executive producer and co-creator of TV shows like Blue's Clues, Super Y, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, basically anything that you feel good about your kids watching she's created it. She's also just come out with a book called Preschool Clues, Raising Smart, Inspired, and Engaged Kids in a Screen-Filled World. You can find that on Amazon. And we are so excited to talk about that because we have been obsessing over screen time and kids as of late. But before we get to all of that, we're going to talk about the most important stuff. So Angela, talk to me. Um, Welcome. And you've got two girls. Let's talk about parenthood right now. Talk to me about your life and what's on the table for you right now. Well, I'm so excited to be here. Just so you know, I'm a big fan of yours. Um, and uh, yeah, it makes me happy. My, my girls are 17, 14. So we're very big on the transition from eighth grade to high school right now and the transition from high school to college. So we're, we're deep in the thick of teenage years. Holy cow. I am in a similar boat. I've got a boy going into high school, a girl in junior high, and my youngest is at elementary school. But I am like, my heart is stopped thinking about the transition to college. So like, how are you feeling? (laughs) Yeah, emotionally, I I do this all the time where I just cry before it happens, you know, like just kind of in it. Um, The idea of what that means, you know, she started driving this year. And um you know, just all of that, leaving the nest kind of feeling. Um, So that's really hard. And I think I just go into producer mode, which is what I do best, right? In terms of, okay, let's see what we need to do to get you to the next step and, and help you know, help you in whatever way we can. So I'm, I'm a little bit in producer mode right now. Yeah. And you know, I call it pre morning. Like I (laughs) cry, I cry and cry and mourn the things like years before they happen. So the moment my first was born, I looked into his little face and I said, Oh my gosh, you're going to go to kindergarten someday. (laughs) The day he was born. Yeah. And right now I'm in that same place where I keep looking at my husband and saying, oh my gosh, we're empty nesters. And he's like, "Uh, we still have like a solid decade of kids living at our house. I like that word for it, that pre-morning, because I definitely have done that my entire life about everything. So I like that I have a word for it now. So thank you. Yeah, I find not everybody's a pre-morner, right? There's an elite crew of us who do this. I remember watching Mamma Mia and crying about that next phase of life. And my girlfriend next to me said, you know, your daughter is five, right? And, you know, it's that same sense of like, you can just feel it from an emotional level. Anyway, yes. Yeah, it's so hard. Talk to me about uh, what are the issues you deal with as a parent right now with teenagers? What's unexpected about teenagers? You know, I think what I I find with teenagers, and I find it really to be true is that they're big preschoolers. So everything that we've dealt with when they were preschoolers in terms of um, that obstinance and that sense of themselves and, you know, the no, and, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, really trying to push those boundaries of, of your world that you've set up, the world that you've set up for them. I find that to be true now that they're teenagers. It's the same thing, um, they can voice it better and articulate it better. And, you know, and really kind of, they're much taller, you know, it's a very different feeling, but a meltdown is still a meltdown, whether, you know, my 17 year old is five foot 11, um, or not, you know, it's that same feeling of emotionally, they need a certain amount, um, of love and, and, and embracing and just kind of having that moment to be little again. And at the end, in the next moment, they are embarking on the world with a million ideas, which, which I love, you know, I tend to, if I can take a step back, I love that they feel that they know everything, you know, and we can have these really philosophical conversations um, and even hard conversations. Right. So, yeah, I think that uh, that's been the most surprising. And also if I take a step back, the most, um, 
that, you know, I, I feel better because my vein of gold is preschool. So I kind of can relate back to that, to that point of, you know, in their lives and kind of look at them as, as big preschoolers. Yeah. And I love that because I actually, something that stuck out to me and I wish I could remember where I read this, but when you have toddlers, they're so irrational and crazy, at least mine were, <laughs> but I was reading all the books, you know, about, I mean, I really pictured my son to grow up to like maraud the streets with brass knuckles and be getting in fights because he had such a hot little head. But one of the things that stuck out to me that I read, and again, I wish I could remember where, was that there's two adolescents. The first one is toddlers and the second one is teenagers. And the issues are basically the same. It's about independence. It's about learning to communicate and to be heard, you know, having emotions that are too big for your body. A lot of that stuff that is just that it's the teenagers are basically preschoolers, right? Just in bigger bodies. So exactly. And even that separation anxiety happening um, at 18 months and then again at five and then again later, right? It just it really does happen in that way. And I think if we remember that, then all of that work that we did when they were preschoolers, you know, and it was very hard, you know, it's hard work, but all of that work truly pays off because they feel that they're in that safe space to talk about certain things or when they're ready, they know that we're there and things like that. Um, we've set that groundwork um, and you can really see the the sprouts growing, you know, in terms of what, you know, taking hold some of the thoughts that we, you know, talked about or some of the ways that we put things in motion for them to be heard, as you said. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you just blew my mind when you said separation anxiety, because Actually, I've totally seen it, right? It's that they're conflicted about this growing up thing. And I've heard, you know, both my kids at different times say, oh man, like I just still want to be little or, but yet at the same time wanting to be big, they're feeling that separation happen. And it's kind of like a tug of war. And I never really put it in that context. So I absolutely love that analogy. One of the things I would say to remember too, right, is, and I'm trying to do this, is that emotionally they're still young, right? And so because they know so much with, you know, the onset of media and the computers and everything, they're they're involved in so much. They're they're they can they read the news when we read it in terms of certain things at this age. And we just keep having to remember that just because they can doesn't mean that they're emotionally ready for it. And so when certain things happen where they're overly stimulated or upset, right? All I see is the obstinance and, you know, them being really angry. And really what it is is that are they're really emotionally not ready for some of the things that we think they are, because they look like adults, but they're not. Yep. And you know what? When it comes to phones, I'm particularly conscious about that. I wish my kids had flip phones, if I could go back in time, but they do have smartphones, but I've locked them down pretty good. I actually deleted the news app off because it comes preloaded because I feel like that 24 hour news cycle that pushes through, they don't need that in their periphery, right? Because I think it overloads them. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's just some of the social media, the Instagram, that some of that where people are still posting and talking about certain things. And what I'm happy about is they'll still bring it around the dinner table, right? So my 17 year old will ask questions about things that she's, you know, read about or whatever and has a point of view and an opinion. So we at least get to talk about it. But you're right. I think especially when they're little, um, no news is much better, right? Just completely, you know, having them feel like they're in a safe space um, and we're taking care of them. Not to quote Daniel Tiger, but I might have to. Oh, please, because I'm going to sing to you a <laughs> Daniel Tiger song today at some point. So <laughs> you're listening to the Today's Mama podcast with your host, Rachel Hersher. We'll be back right after this. For breakfast, you ate one stale goldfish you found in the car seat. Your hair is still sticky from last night's applesauce hands. You have to pick up dry cleaning, go to the store, unclog Mr. Fuzzy from the toilet, and then get the kids from school. (sighs) You deserve something easy. Now you can automatically create 60-page photo books straight from your phone's camera roll and social media for just $10 with free shipping. Time flies. Hang on to every weird, wild moment with chat books. And now back to the Today's Mama podcast with your host, Rachel Hersher. One of my favorite things anyone said to me when my kids were little and I would get so afraid of having teenagers was 
teenagers are my favorite. They are the funnest. And I decided I had to shift my mindset from dreading my kids being teenagers to deciding, oh my gosh, like they're going to be so fun. And the most surprising thing to me probably is that honestly, I do think teenagers are so fun. Like, and I like that we can have those conversations you're talking about that are both serious, but that are like hilarious. And, you know, we're having a blast. How do you feel about teenagehood in general? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I feel like, um, you know, I always say in some ways, I feel like we've grown like our, you know, people that we want to hang out with because they are um, interesting and introspective and have a point of view about the world and definitely feel strongly about things. And I, and I love that, whether I agree or I don't agree, you know, I want them to have that sense. So I find them really fun as well. Um, and I remember when they were younger, you know, we'd be online somewhere and I'd see teenagers all together and I'd say, look, one day you're not going to want me to be here with you. You're going to want to be hanging out with your friends. And Hope turned around and she said, why, when you talk about me growing up, I'm always such a jerk to you. <laughs> Why do you say that? Like, I'm not nice to you. And I, I said, I said, I think I say it because that's my worst fear is that you're going to be doing that. So yeah, it hasn't come true. They're still, um, you know, pretty fine to hang out with us um, in addition to their friends. So yeah. And I love that. It's really like shift our expectation because really, I think life tends to live up to our expectations a lot of times. So you know, if we expect them to be awesome and if we expect them to be the people we want to hang out with, we'll move in that direction. Not to say that we always want to hang out with them because sometimes they're crazy, but <laughs> I think it can move that way. Exactly. And sometimes you need to be the parent, right? So it's not necessarily that they are your friends. It's just that they're people that you actually really still like as teenagers, which we didn't hear all the time, right? My mother would say it say it forever to and I to fear the fear of God in me about teenagers and I agree with you turning it around I I love it yeah and I agree with you it doesn't mean we have to be their best friends all the time I mean I am the queen of putting the smack down um yep. <laughs> my son wrote me a note that said I like how you can always get madder than me <laughs> Mm -hmm. because it like chills him out somehow like somehow I'm like a pro at raising the stakes and being like oh you want me to burn it down guys I'll burn it down yeah exactly well I think they want that right they want that in some ways they're looking for a boundary and looking for us to make a decision on something right in terms of being wishy-washy or whatever like I find it as a manager too right in work like I think that you want those that boundary um as opposed to loosey-goosey all the time but anyway that's definitely yes. a, a point of view that I have too. Well, and actually just side note on a work thing, because we both run our own businesses, really. I've had to go through stages of learning. Oh my gosh. So we all work from home and I want people to be super independent and self-driven and to make their own rules. Right. But that sets a lot of people up to flounder. And it was a hard lesson mm -hmm. for me to learn from a business perspective to be like, nope, like, here's what I want. Here's how I want it done. Here's when it needs to be done. I mean, I can still improve in that way, but it's a hard thing to be for me sometimes. Yeah, no, it is because I, I agree. It's intrinsically motivated, right? Like, and I think that's something we want to instill in our kids too, right? They're intrinsically motivated to solve their own problems or to, you know, do what they need to do for the work. And I think my favorite quote is, don't make me be the boss. Like, I don't want to have to be that boss. Like, you know, I just need to set up what that sandbox is for them to play in. Um, and then I want to give them creative freedom because we work, we both work in creative fields, right? But I agree, like I've learned the hard way that I need to provide that sandbox sandbox and then continue to check in on that, right? And to and to articulate what it is that our expect, expectations are and what that strategy is. And then um, I think that we really get amazing, amazing work. Yes. I love that. And the independence piece for them is huge. I mean, honestly, junior high and high school, if they've had a problem with a teacher, it's their job to go work out. You know, they have to go find the things. I don't check their grades online. You know, they have to do those things and that's kind of the sandbox we've built. But if there is a time where I need to sail in, I will like when, you know, my son is having a ego battle with his PE teacher, I got to slide in there a little bit, but for the most part, it's all on them. Yeah. And how great is that, right? To learn that before they get to college and before they get out in the world, that they have to be the ones to talk to their teachers and take control over this aspect of their lives, right? Because it is, it is important. I agree. We, we instill the same, the same thing over here. 
Yeah, definitely. So whether it's like changing their schedule at school or any of those logistical things, like I think it's so important that they learn how to do the stuff so that when they get to college, they can go handle their schedule. Because that's what I'm hearing from a lot of people is that there's these college kids who really can't even like register for their classes by themselves. And so I guess I'm setting the bar low if I'm just like, if I can raise you to be able to register for your own college classes, we've made it. (laughs) Anyway, okay, my next question for you is if you could go back in time, so when your kids were younger, is there anything you would change about that time or your parenting or go back and tell yourself a lesson that you wish you would have known then? Is there anything you wish you could go back and change? You know, I think that I wouldn't have been as fearful as I was. I think that I took this this all of a sudden as a mom, right? And I was like, I was the constant camp counselor. I was the babysitter that had to like have an Excel chart to keep track of all the babysitting I was doing, you know, all in the classroom when I was in college. But once I had my own kids, I was like, I need to keep you alive. You know, like it just freaked me out so much. Um, and I think I would tell myself to relax a little bit. But I think the play piece, right? Like I, I almost want to remember that day that when it was the the last day that we really played as preschoolers, you know, like when they were that little, because it was so much fun. Um, and doing more of it, I think I would have made more time to do it, you know, like leave the dishes in the dishwasher and, uh, and do it. Yeah. No, you just said you wish you could go back to that day. And just last night, I found myself scrolling through pictures. And I found a picture of my almost 16 year old when he was like, three or four, getting a pirate costume for Christmas and how pumped he was and how he dressed up and posed and all the things. And I just, my heart, like, it's like full of love, but also full of this longing to just go back and live in those moments for just a few minutes. Oh my gosh. We watch our family movies sometimes together. And what's so fascinating to me is the kids almost don't, they don't really remember that time. And it's obviously so vivid to us and it's hysterical for them to say, I was kind of a crazy, crazy little kid. Like, oh my God. Um, But yeah, and I'm watching those and I just cry, right? I can't believe it went so fast. Yeah. It goes so fast. I feel like it was just five minutes ago. I know I do too. Uh, Well, okay. So traveling back in time a little further, This is one of my favorite questions to ask people, but have you seen the movie Ratatouille, (laughs) the rats that are chefs? Yes. Okay. So there's an amazing scene in the movie where the restaurant critic, his name is Anton Ego. It's at the end. He finally tastes the ratatouille that they brought him out. And he has this whole flashback to when he was a kid. And you see this like little boy, this awkward little boy walking through the door to his house and he takes a breath. And he smells his mother's ratatouille that she's cooked. And he sits at the table and you see this little stressed out kid and he takes his bite and he just melts and he feels loved. And basically that was home for him, right? And that's what the scene in the movie, that's what eating that food did for him. So my question for you is, do you have a ratatouille? Is it a smell of your childhood? Is it a feeling of your childhood. I mean, my husband's is smelling lilac bushes because when he was little, that's where he would build his forts was in the lilac bushes behind his house. And mine is the smell of (laughs) construction, like drywall mud, because I loved visiting work sites with my dad. And so, I mean, when I walk in somewhere with like fresh drywall mud, it's just like I breathe it in and I'm like five years old again. So that's my question for you. Do you have a ratatouille from your childhood? Uh, I love this question. Um, And I love those moments when it happens, right? When it hits you and you're like, oh my God, I am now five years old. I think I have a few, right? So I'm Italian and I have a huge Italian family. So I think any sort of Italian pasta smells does that for me. Any uh, loud conversations can bring me back. The vinyl, the smell of vinyl record brings me back to my grease days of like, performing it in my basement um, with my sister over and over and over again. I'm thinking of like any, like a Brian Adams song will bring me back to high school, like within one second, you know, it's like those, those moments of like, Oh, right there. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I had a new one the other day. I went to drop my daughter off to ballet class. She's nine. And I walked in the building. It was an older building and they had a swamp cooler running and the smell of a swamp cooler. Like, mm, it's, I guess it's like probably bad. It's probably a little moldy, but <laughs> I, I was like, mm, summertime. Aww. I like could hear the ice cream. Truck. <laughs> it was so good. Oh, I love that. 
I love your answers. And I love how different yours are, especially because you come from an Italian family, your touch points of Italian food and the noise, like the the noise, hearing mm-hmm. like loud noise would probably stress me out. But for you, that's just like big and fun and family. So you're listening to the Today's Mama podcast with your host, Rachel Hersher. We'll be back right after this. It feels like there's never enough time to do it all. The kids keep growing, and sure, you keep taking photos of every little magical, maniacal moment. But then what? Get photos off your phone and into your hands with chatbooks. Automatically create beautiful 60-page photo books in minutes, right from your camera roll and social media, starting at just $10 with free shipping. Keep calm and mom on with chatbooks. And now back to the Today's Mama podcast with your host, Rachel Hersher. Let's talk about Blue's Clues because it's coming back. But I want to start with what I find to be one of the most entertaining things about Blue's Clues is over the years, there have been so many conspiracy theories about Steve. So like, break it down for me. What really happened to Steve? (laughs) You know, and it's hard for him. It is so hard for him because it's just coming back again. There was a meme. And, you know, I think because he um, wanted, was going to leave the show, um, I think that that's where the rumors kind of started in terms of how, um, what was going on behind the scenes with that. And also I think, you know, it was funny because once we became, a big hit, which was exciting for us as a kid's show that we became in the pop culture, right? We became something that people were talking about. It ultimately turns negative, right? Like it just kind of, as much as you get built up, right? There's like this negative side to it. And I think what's so hard is he's a person with a family and, you know, his mother gets very upset when these things come out, you know, and I, I fell for it a couple of years ago where the conspiracy theory came out and I had everybody calling me and I lost it. Like, I was like, oh my God, car accident, what happened? And I texted him and he's like, no, I'm fine. You know, and it's just... Yeah, it's it's hard for him. It's it's definitely hard for him. But, you know, ultimately he was 21 when he started the show and 6 years later, you know, it's a big big job and a big responsibility, I think, and he yeah. really was ready to to move on and I think that that's that's what happens. You know, no one expects a TV show to last as long as we did and we were such a family and we still are such a family that I think it was a it was a hard decision for him and ultimately, right, we supported him and he supported us in terms of transitioning Donovan into the role of Joe. So it was all positive. So I don't know sometimes where that negativity comes from. It's like Steve's become an urban legend of the internet, right? And he every so often has to pop up and be like, guys, like I'm still alive. (laughs) I'm not in a ditch somewhere. But I have to tell you a funny story. So Back in like 2006, probably, I was doing an interview with a radio host about some books that we had out at the time. And somehow we got on the topic of Blue's Clues and children's shows. And this guy was like, oh my gosh, my wife has the biggest crush on Steve. And I was dying because it's like Steve from Blue's Clues, like, and he's got his like (laughs) rugby on. And all of a sudden we had these women calling into the show being like, I love Steve. And it was so funny. There's like a cult following out there of like these moms and women who totally had crushes on Steve. Did you hear about that at all? I thought you were going to say, did you have a crush on Steve? (laughs) Yeah, I did. Admit it. (laughs) Admit it. You know, I have to tell you the, you know, looking to the camera and being as charming and as well versed of an actor as he is, um, it really does take you over. Like you believe he's talking to you and how sweet he was um, about Blue, right? You just fell into it and believe it. Yeah. And his big eyes would totally get you. And even to this day, we were, because um, he's he's part of the, the relaunch in the sense of working with us. And he looked at us and did a line um, from the show and all of us melted. Like we were like, I cannot believe you still have it. Like I can't it's believe so you funny. can still do that to us. He's really talented. And I think I have to say filling his shoes with the relaunch of Blue's Clues is a big job. Yeah. And you know what? Talk about that. 
filling his shoes is a really big job for the relaunch, right? So what's that process? How do you find a new Steve who I know, I feel like I've been seeing some things online where you've been, you've just had lines and lines of people showing up to try out and all this stuff. Like how is that process working out? You know, it's amazing. And the love for the show has been ridiculously overwhelming. And so much so that we've had um, a really amazing team. Like we worked on the show for 10 years, full time, 80 of us, right? And so we became a ridiculously passionate family. And so we've had some of our dream team come back together um, to support this relaunch because we want to be as careful about it as possible. Like the truth is it could be a parody of itself, which we never will let happen, right? And so it needs to be thoughtful and um, really kind of elegant the way that it needs to be relaunched into the world today. But we've auditioned, I think, over 2,000 people and the Nickelodeon casting people are experts and amazing at what they do and really looking for that right person. And it's, it wasn't easy the first time. It wasn't easy the second time, you know, and this third time, um, you know, now that we've had kids who've grown up on the show, want to come out and be part of the show. Like, again, like we've just had this amazing love pouring out. And so it's really our job, which is not an easy one to just find who that next person truly is. And I think that we're just very laser focused on that. And Tracy Page Johnson, my co-creator and I have been um, working very hard with with um, Sarah Landy and the Nickelodeon casting team to just find that right person. Yeah. And when is Blue's Clues set to launch again? Because you're obviously still lining up some of those big pieces. What does that calendar look like? Yeah, we're in production now. Um, so I don't know if Nickelodeon has announced exactly when the show will premiere, but um, it's going to take a bit for us to go through the production process. And I can loop back with you um, in terms of that that date. Love it. We'd love to help promote it. I mean, it will not need our help in promoting once it goes back. Everybody will be on the edge of their seats, but we'll certainly be ready to like scream it from the roof. No, I'd love for you to talk about it. Of course. I would love for you to do that. Well, and you know, going back to the original show. So I don't know if you remember, it was how many years ago, probably five or six years ago, I reached out to you because I was working on a talk that I did for TEDx. And it was all about asking questions. And it turns out you guys were actually really big kind of innovators when it came to TV and actually asking questions to the kids. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. You know, it's actually um, a chapter in my book called The Pause. Um, And it's actually, I guess I could, when I say it out loud like that, it sounds like Blue's Pause. But no, like literally pausing on TV was kind of a big deal back in the day because we left this blank air um, for kids to answer back. And so the idea of Steve and then Joe looking to the camera and waiting for kids to answer was really the secret sauce in terms of how long we waited Um, for interactive TV at the time. And I'm using air quotes, right? In terms of what interactive looks like. This is 1995 when we were developing, 96 when we were on the air. So people were talking about interactive TV, but obviously no iPad, no apps, none of that was was happening. And so we really wanted to have that active participation. And we had studied, um, I had studied with um, Dr. Dan Anderson, who talked a lot about the fact that kids were not couch potatoes, right? That they're always thinking, they're always... Um, processing. And so if we can give them enough time to process and talk back, it's basically giving them those active listening skills, right? Like we're literally asking a question and waiting for them to have the time that they need to answer with their point of view and giving them a voice. And so that's, that's really what we did. And it became something that I've incorporated in different ways in all of my shows. Um, And I know other people have done that as well, because the idea of playing with preschoolers, having them practice the skills that we want them to take away with, whether it's like socio-emotional strategies with Daniel Tiger, right? So that they can use them in their world. Like we want them to own them. So the only way to do that is to, is to really give them the space and the time to, to talk with us about what it is that we're, we're trying, you know, whether it's to sing back the Daniel strategy or, you know, practice a skill like a kindergarten readiness skill on Blue's Clues. So yeah, so I'm a huge believer on, in getting the kids to, to be part of the show with us. Um, and, and I think they love it. I know they love it. Yeah. Well, and let's talk about the pace a little bit, because 
I do feel that because there are those pauses in the show, the pace is slowed down, which is something that I have always loved about every show you've touched. Because right now, if you turn on any number of children's shows, the screen is changing every half second to second, which I think is just frying our kids' brains. Do you have any opinions on that? I mean, will you keep the pace slower on these shows? And how do you feel about the faster pace that everything's moving moving at specifically on TV shows for kids? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, you've heard people say that that it with movies, right? Rated G is now really rated PG and rated PG is really rated R, you know, like those kinds of things where everything is kind of aged up. And I find that in television and media as well, right? When you're creating something for two to fives, um, they're looking at as large of an audience as possible. So sometimes people are really writing to the sixes um, so that they can get four to six or six to seven or, or even older, right? Six to 11 becomes more teenage. So anyway, you're going to get that faster paced adventure feel. Um, and, you know, the older kids might be able to follow, but the younger kids, of course, have that overstimulation. And yeah, I'm not, I don't believe that that fast pace um, and there's research to back it up, right, is good for the little ones to be absorbing. And so I think part of the book is to talk about how to how to look at and look for quality kids shows, not not just mine, right, just shows in general, or apps in general, or what it is that we're feeding our kids brains when we're putting media on for them, and to look for things like that. And I, I think looking for something that's created for that age group, the age group that your child is, and us knowing our kids, like my kids were very, um, they would get overstimulated or have a higher, they didn't have as high a threshold for things that were scary, right? So that had to, they had to kind of step away from things that had overly, that they were overly empathetic or overly emotional to. And so I knew that about my kids. And so they had to kind of, we had to slowly introduce them to things like that or not at all. And so, yeah, I think that it, that the pacing is very, deliberate in my shows. For for Daniel, we're really targeting those young preschoolers. And so therefore the pacing has to be at that level so that they're with us on the journey. Like we talk a lot about how in the writer's room, we don't care if we make ourselves laugh. You know, we really care whether or not we're making kids laugh or we're making the kids that we're writing for, you know, they understand what what we're talking about. Um, And that's really important. That goes to the pacing and it goes to the respectful dialogue that we have and the themes that we put in our shows. Yeah. And just a reminder for everybody, the book that you have just come out with is Preschool Clues, Raising Smart, Inspired and Engaged Kids in a Screen Filled World. You can find it on Amazon. Where else can people pick it up? Yeah, it's everywhere books are. Um, Barnes and Noble, everywhere books are. Yeah. So what else in that book? What are some of the other big points that you want parents to pay attention to? Um, What is huge on your radar right now for those preschool age kids? You know, I think that I don't want parents to feel guilty about letting their kids watch media if they're choosing the quality media, right? We know that kids um, are learning. We have research to support that kids are actually you know, statistically, statistically significantly um, testing better on the skills that we're putting in our shows from a Blue's Clues for Kindergarten Readiness to the, to the University of Texas doing a study on socio-emotional and feelings vocabulary and, you know, moving the needle on, um, on that for Daniel Tiger, right? So we have, we have that research that backs it up. And so I don't want parents to feel guilty about it. It is a tool and it is a box and not all content is created equal, right? And so being aware of, I've been calling it like a healthy green smoothie. Um, And that includes engagement and entertainment and education so that you're looking at, at, at the sweets as well as the greens, as well as the protein, right? So when you're looking at media for our kids, because, because we know that they're going to um, there's peer modeling, they're going to embrace the the language that they're hearing. We're going to, you know, we're going to be basically teaching them, quote unquote, any of the themes that we're showcasing. And so while I don't want parents to feel guilty because we know that quality media can move the needle, um, I also want us to read the nutrition labels on all the content. And because we don't have them, common sense media or give, you know, in the book, I give um, different ways to look at and assess um, media so that we can be actively involved. We don't have to watch everything with our kids, but we're at least actively involved in the sense that we know what they're watching. And then we talk about it. You know, we talk, we can talk about Daniel as a friend of our preschoolers in the same way we talk about, you know, Johnny B as a friend of their preschoolers, who's really in their preschool classroom, right? It's the same 
the kids, our preschoolers are feeling the same way about their animated friends as they are about their real friends. Yeah. Well, and I have to tell you, it's my favorite and funniest thing. I have a little niece. She's four years old right now. And Daniel Tiger is her imaginary husband. So like she will, (laughs) I've got to send you the video. She came out and she was giving us a dance performance the other day and she walked out and she goes, hit it, Daniel. (laughs) So that Daniel was hitting the music and then she did her dance performance. And we'll always ask her like, Hey, how's your husband, Daniel Tiger? And she's like, Oh, he's at college right now. Or, Oh, he's playing basketball with his friends right now. Like Daniel Tiger is always busy doing something. So we can't see him, but he's a very big part of her world right now. (laughs) Oh my God. I love that so much. Honestly, here's the crazy thing for you is you've created some things that are actually, they become part of the fabric of people's childhoods and families and their memories. I mean, even right now, like our family, like I said, my kids are a little older now. We're 15, 14, and nine, but like at least once a week, one of us will sing, and I'm going to sing it for you now. If you're feeling mad and you want to (laughs) roar, like we do that whole song (laughs) and we roar and we laugh and like, I mean, that's, I I don't know really what my question is there, but it has to be a really crazy feeling to think of the impact, how you become part of the fabric of people's lives, literally. Yeah, it is. It's an overwhelming feeling and it's the best part of, of what I do. Right. And I love hearing those stories, but I love when I can hear them or see them firsthand. I was at dinner recently um, and there were two couples having dinner next to us. And one couple starts to talk about Daniel Tiger and saying, no, no, really, have you seen this show? This is, this is an amazing, and they start to literally talk about why it's so amazing. And of course I could not participate in my own dinner because all I could think about was I need to hear what they're saying. This is like, this is the best thing ever. Um, And of course I had to introduce myself so that I wasn't such a, you know, creepy person sitting and listening to their conversation. And I, and I found myself being like, just so you know, there's a potty episode coming out and there's this episode. Um, it was great. We had this great conversation about what they wanted to see Daniel do. Um, but yeah, so when you're able to, and I remember being on the beach and kids were on the beach and playing with shovel and pail from Blue's Clues. And I just, you know, burst into tears. Like, it's just one of those amazing things. Cause you just, you know, you think you're writing for yourself and in your own head. And then when you do see it out in the world, you're like, Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Cool. Well, tell me what you have a pretty big list of shows you've worked on. What are all the shows that kind of fall under your umbrella? So blues clues was the first, um, with Nickelodeon. And then I went out on my own and I went out and started a production company and super Y was the first show. Um, that I ha- actually had written as my master's thesis, but it's a, a superheroes with the power to read. And so that was a, a PBS show um, that's still airing now and still doing well. Um, and then uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood for PBS, which is the legacy property of the Mr. Rogers show. And then um, for Amazon, we did Creative Galaxy, which is a creative arts series, um, Wish and Poof, which is also on Amazon. That's executive learning based on the mind of the making um, and Ellen Galinsky's work on basically the next step from what Daniel Tiger does, a little bit older um, to the, the kinds of skills that kids need in this really great fantastical world of this little girl who finds out that she's a fairy. Um, but has to be a regular kid in her regular world. And then we're just doing a new show for Netflix that will premiere next year um, called Color Forms, Charlie in Color Form City, and based on the Color Forms brand. So it's all about um, building and storytelling and um, shapes coming together to create your world and this level of imagination in story, um, which is really, really fun and really great too. That'll come out next year. Oh, I love it. And, you know, while we have you, what are some of the shows that you love that you would recommend to other people that maybe weren't under your umbrella? Like what did your kids love and what do you love to recommend now that you feel like does that whole smoothie thing? Yeah, I think that there's definitely, um, especially, you know, so many shows, especially when we premiered Blue's Clues, there really wasn't anything else out there except for Sesame Street, you know, that was still going on for that age group. And now I do believe we have so many. And so one of the things that I have to say that I'm most proud of is that my writing team on Blue's Clues have all grown up and created shows of their own. So I'm very proud of their shows. Um, Blaze on Nick Jr., um, which is from Jeff Borkin, uh, Wally Kazam and on from Adam Peltzman on Nick Jr. and also Odd Squad on PBS. 
Um, and then Sasha Palladino um, did Miles from Tomorrowland on Disney. And they were all people, staff that worked with me for full time for 10 years. And they've taken, I think, a lot of what what our philosophy is about the passion for kids um, out into the world. And I would say that PBS shows um, always have a curriculum base and they always have um, a consultant, you know, really working with them and working it through. And so I feel very good about the shows that are on PBS and, and under Linda Semensky. So I think there's, you know, I think that as you age up older and older kids, I find it harder and harder to find things that I truly love. Um, you know, I think me, the girls and I watched Gilmore Girls together and we thought that was a little bit old for them when we started watching it, but yeah. you know, it was really great for us to talk about it together. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's harder and harder. Um, I think as they age to find things that, that you can feel really good about, but for the younger kids, I think there's a lot of great preschool stuff out there. Yeah, I agree. And honestly, PBS is like my happy place. You know, you never have to worry, really, when they've got something on from PBS. So, well, you have been amazing. Seriously, thank you so much for coming on today. Again, I want to remind people that you can grab Angela's book, Preschool Clues. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it wherever books are sold. Blue's Clues will keep you posted when that hits the scene again. And then you'll be able to find show notes and links with more information on everything we talked about today over at todaysmama.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a weekly newsletter there if you want updates. And of course, please, please, please go subscribe on iTunes. Angela, tell everybody where the best place to find you online is. If someone wants to follow you on Instagram or anywhere else, where do you want people to come and find you? Yes, my website is angelasclues.com. And that's also my Twitter handle and Instagram name and on Facebook fan page and those kinds of things. So I definitely update on all things media and that I'm working on there. Perfect. Thank you so much again for being here and we will be keeping in touch. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You can find the show notes for this episode at todaysmama.com slash podcast. You'll find links to everything we talked about in this episode, and we've packed todaysmama.com with a few extra bonuses, including Angela's secret Italian family recipe for eggplant meatballs. These things are for real. This is authentic Italian food and all her childhood memories packed into a neat little dish. You've got to try these. Some graphic printable quotes from this episode will be on the show notes. Really deep things pour from our mouths on this podcast. I mean, meme-worthy things, graphic quote-worthy things. You can find those there in the show notes. And of course, we're giving away copies of Angela's book, Preschool Clues. You can get all those details there in the show notes. Now, for one last heart-to-heart, listen. We want to be best friends. Take us on your next family road trip. Take us to the pool with you. I mean, we'll follow you anywhere. In other words, please, please, please subscribe and keep in touch. We've got more amazing things planned. Visit todaysmama.com slash podcast for links to subscribe just about anywhere because we'll follow you just about anywhere. See you next time. You've been listening to the Today's Mama podcast with Rachel Hersher. To find out more, go to todaysmama.com. That's todaysmama.com. Today's Mama, connecting moms and families with the best of today. Today's Mama.